Hi, welcome to How to d d My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons 5e. And yes, we could talk about the Master Sword, but what we're going to talk about instead of the Master Sword is we're going to talk about magic items in the Lost Mine of Fandelva. Believe it or not, somebody's actually making a video on the topic and it just happens to be me. <laughs> I'm not surprised. This is a Dungeon Master Guide to the Lost Mine of Fandelva. If you are a player playing in this adventure, do not stick around. Go finish playing the adventure first, and then you can come back and have a look at this video if you like. Otherwise, I think you will find your Dungeon Master will not be very happy with you if you stick around. But if you are a Dungeon Master planning to run this adventure or running this adventure, stick around because I will answer the questions that you probably have on the topic. Here we go. First question, should magic items be added to this, this adventure? Should you add in additional magic items that are not included in the adventure? Okay, so my answer to you on this is no. I would not recommend adding additional magic items to the adventure. Although there is an exception, potions of healing are always a good idea, particularly with a group who do not take uh, a class who have healing abilities. So if you had a class uh, like Cleric, Bard, uh, you know, they work fine, Druid, they're all good at healing, but if nobody takes that class, then dropping a lot more healing potions might be really helpful. Otherwise, they will be relying very much on the short rest. Okay, next question. Should magic items be removed from the adventure? Now, I know a lot of people are going to get confused by my answer to this, but there are multiple aspects to it. Really, I would say when it comes to should you actually remove something from the adventure, that is up to you. If you want them to be rare in your world, if you feel there are enough magic items in the adventure already that you do not need to add any more, uh, great. If you feel that you want to go and take out, I mean, it's really, I mean, the thing is, when you remove stuff, people aren't necessarily going to know that that's the case. Unless you're playing Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League, they really won't know if the magic items were in the adventure or not in the adventure. So that's up to you. What would I re recommend? What is my recommendation? I recommend that you learn to deal with these as a dungeon master. This is why I'm saying don't remove the magic items that are already placed in the adventure. You need to adapt and develop skills around this, and you can't do that if you keep removing them from the game. So I would recommend leaving them in. Why? Well, there are a couple of reasons. This is part of it. But I would say that players love magic items, and too few will rec you'll get resentment. Players always get uh, angry, annoyed, uh, resent the dungeon master because they don't get enough goodies in the adventure. And whether we like it or not, that tends to be the mentality of a lot of players because of the modern age, and because they've probably, you know, if they've played before 3.5 and 4e, there were lots of magic items. If they played video games, there were lots of magic items. So make sure you include plenty of them. Okay, another reason why you don't really need to remove these magic items from the game. Most of the really powerful permanent magic items are found in the very last quest, Wave Echo Cave. That's where most of them are. They're not really scattered throughout the adventure that much. So that means you're only really dealing with them at the very end of the adventure rather than at the beginning of the adventure. That makes a huge difference. They're going to be about level 4 when they get there. So that's not quite so bad. There is a trade-off. Uh, having those magic items can make the battle with Nesna the Black Spider much easier. I, I won't dispute that. It's true. If, you, if they have access to those magic items, they find them. And, uh, and they encounter Nesna the Black Spider, Nesna the Black Spider is probably going to be destroyed pretty easily if you don't know what you're doing and they have access to all of those particular magic items that are listed in the back of the adventure. The other thing to remember is that the, the magic items really only affect the game if you continue 
playing the campaign after the Lost Mine of Fandelver. If you complete the adventure Lost Mine of Fandelver and you decide I'm going to transition into another adventure, we're going to continue with the level 5 characters, then that's when you're going to see the greatest effect on your game. That's when it's really going to show up the most. Okay, just so you are aware. Are the magic items in the Lost Mine of Fandalva too powerful? This is the other question that a lot, a lot of people have. Are there magic items that I should be concerned about because they are incredibly powerful? I have a particular view around magic items and my belief is, and I have put this into practice, that really the players don't need magic items to be able to be successful in Dungeons & Dragons 5e. They really do not need them. Uh, but they like them, so we can't get past that particular aspect of the game, can we? There are no simple answers to the question, but I'm going to break it down one item at a time so you can see what I have to tell you about each one, and then you can sort of decide uh, amongst yourselves whether you like the idea of leaving that magic item there, or whether you need to trim things down, or you want to make adjustments, or not make adjustments. But uh, that's what we're going to do. I think that is the, probably the easiest way to deal with something like magic items in your game, is to break everything down bit by bit so you can see everything nice and clearly. Okay, covering all of the magic items that we have, these are the magic items in the Lost Mine of Fandelva, starting with number one. I'm going to break it down into the, the consumables first. Don't worry about potions and scrolls as they get consumed. They have a one-use application. Once they get them and use them, they're gone. And there aren't that many of them in the game that you need to worry about. So don't freak out about potions and scrolls. Number two is the boots of striding and springing. This is quite an amusing magic item, if you ask me. It affects the walking speed. It's only really going to make them walk as fast as 30 feet. If they walk, walk that speed already, that's going to have no effect whatsoever. If they're a smaller creature and they walk at 25 feet, then now they can move 30 feet. Who cares? And it also improves their jumping, which will have little to no effect on your game unless you run your Lost Mine of Fandelva adventure like the Super Mario Brothers. If you don't run your game like the Super Mario Brothers, then it won't have... <laughs> it won't have any effect, you'll be fine. Number three, the Wand of Magic Missile. This is a, hmm, this is like having a low level wizard in your party when you have this item available to your players. Which means potentially they can cast from it, and anybody could, it doesn't necessarily have to be a wizard or a sorcerer or anybody with any kind of arcane uh, knowledge or skill, it could be six magic missiles each day, and then because they can do that, they're going to supernova, if they are a caster, they'll supernova all of their spell slots, burn through all their spell slots, and then use this item as a backup. I think that's the thing that I've noticed the most when people get access to the magic missile wand, is they just burn through their slots, knowing fully well that they can probably keep going for a decent amount of time because they have this magic missile wand. Okay, number four. Number four is one of my least favorite magic items in the game because it's almost always consistently requested by my players, particularly of a certain class and a certain play style. So the gauntlets, the gauntlets of Ogre Power are enormously beneficial to weaker player characters. Why? I will explain. They're overpowered in every sense because they improve your melee attack and damage rolls. They will increase, increase the strength checks that you might have to take. That includes something like an athletics check. What is an athletics check used for? It's used for grappling, it's shoving, and, and try to escape from a grapple or a shove. Your carrying capacity is going to improve. Now that might not seem like an awful lot, but carrying capacity affects your ability to wear different types of armor. So if you are on the, if you are deciding to multi-class your your character, and suddenly you are picking up different proficiencies, and you are struggling because you're spreading all of your points all over the place, you don't have to worry about that sort of thing because 
gauntlets of ogre power give you a, a straight out 19 in strength, which is fantastic. Beware of paladins, barbarians, fighters, monks, and strength-based classes that grab this item and then all they do is just take or stock up on feats because feats are incredibly powerful and if you're using them in your game you will find that they don't need to worry about powering up their ability score they can just keep grabbing the feats because for them the extra benefit of having a 20 in strength may not be worthwhile compared to taking something like a feat such as sentinel a weapon master and sharpshooter and other things like that so just be aware of that i have always found that uh, if i start off a game at a higher level than level one and i say okay you can have a magic item what would you like most of the time they will say particularly if a, um, if it's the rarity is uh you know sort of common uncommon and not too high the first thing i get is well gauntlets of ogre power fred and it's a trap just so you know. Okay, number five is the Staff of Defense. Now, Staff of Defense shows up in the Red Brand Hideout. So this is the one item that really is going to be showing up much earlier in the adventure compared to later on. This is not great for a mage or a wizard or sorcerer because the, the casting of shield is an action rather than a reaction. And I know a lot of players who got, got really confused when they saw this item they said well that doesn't make sense because you know in the book it must be a misprint uh, the staff must only be used for reactions because that's how shield works but that's not how it works so it's not great for a mage sorcerer or a wizard okay but it's crazy good for a heavily armored tank and a choke point where there's just a five foot space and that's it and they can just stand there with this incredibly high armor class. How do they do that? Potentially they can cast four shield spells and one mage armor, which of course they probably won't do unless they are sleeping and they don't want to sleep in their armor because there are disadvantages to doing that. But the benefit is that four shield spells per day without breaking the item. An armor class of plus one is also included in the staff and that makes a big difference in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. I know a lot of people say that these ones and twos in Dungeons and Dragons are not a big deal but they, they do actually make a huge difference and in particular to armor class because of the concept of bound accuracy but I'll, I'll get back to that. Okay number six is the spider staff. Potentially four web spells every day and one spider climb spell. So that's really significant. But on top of that, you get significant melee damage increase at low level. And in fact, really, it's going to affect you know what, what your level is. Uh, 1d6, an extra 1d6 poison damage will make a difference. That's with every single attack. So if it winds up in the hands of somebody who has multiple attacks, they're getting a additional 1d6 for every attack they make with the thing. Which means that it's not necessarily the weapon that's going to be picked up by a mage, even though you can cast web with it. Now the thing about the web spell is it's a battle winning control spell, particularly in confined locations because it ties up the enemy and makes it pretty hard for them to maneuver. So just be aware of that particular item. But like I said, you don't need to worry so much about that item because it doesn't show up to much later in the adventure. Okay, number seven. Number seven is the Ring of Protection. It gives you a bonus of plus one to your armor class and it gives you a plus one to saving throws. All saving throws, including death saving throws, which is actually quite rare. You don't usually have too many things that can change that. So it's quite a good item. But in the hands of a low armor class character, it's not really going to be too concerning. When it becomes dangerous, it's dangerous in the possession of, yet again, those heavily armored classes and characters. Armor class bonuses have a drastic effect on the chance to actually affect hitting the target. So... An extra plus one 
makes a big difference. The fact that you get plus one to every single saving throw as well, and there are six different um, saving throws, and then on top of that you have the death saving throw, this is a really good item. What I find is the heavily armoured characters, they want to try and get a ring that will give them an armour class bonus. They'll want to grab some armour that gives them an armour class bonus. Uh, and I mean magic armour, okay? Not just standard armour, not just full plate armour or breastplate armour. They were looking for something a bit more impressive than that. So then you go around and you, you start collecting all the other items that can give you those bonuses. It can have an enormous effect on the game. And it, you won't even be able to hit those targets half the time then. Okay, number eight is magic armor. That's the magic plus one armor that is, exists in the game. This makes a big difference again. As I mentioned, uh, because of the, the fact that it's going to increase the, uh, the difficulty in hitting the target, it increases the armor class. What it's doing is it's countering bound accuracy. The idea is that of bound accuracy is that you really can't get your armor class that high. But if you put on a ring, you wind up with armor and you wind up with other things that will change that, then that changes everything. You can wind up with characters walking around with a 25 AC. I've even seen 30 as an AC in the game of Dungeons and Dragons 5e. It's probably not going to happen in your game. It would take a bit of time, but it's still an issue. I consider magic armor much more troublesome than a magic weapon just because of the way it affects bound accuracy and the chance to hit. Okay, the last thing you probably need to talk about, and that is number nine, that is the magic plus one weapons. These will not break your game. Okay, they don't break the game. But challenge rating becomes completely pointless as a guide at low level you will have to modify monsters to challenge your player's characters. Now, I know a few people are going to say, uh, hang on, Fred, but uh, is challenge rating ever any point to it whatsoever? And you're probably right. I tend to find that challenge rating after level 5 or 6 is a waste of my time. But at low level, it's still a, a reasonable guide, I find. But it will not apply as soon as characters have plus one magic weapons and of course even something as high as a plus two or plus three it makes it even worse okay now why is that one challenge rating no longer useful to you whatsoever additional work you have to do because you have to modify every monster and you might find you have to push the monsters hit points up to maximum to make them a challenge magic weapons also eliminate a monster's damage resistances, and immunities. Now, we're not so concerned about dealing with the immunities because we, we want them to be able to actually do something to the creature at some point with something. Damage resistances, a lot of monsters have damage resistances, and as a result of the damage resistance, they don't have to have that many hit points to keep them in the game. But as soon as you start mucking with that, it changes everything, okay? Okay. Then again, as I said, I find magic armor much more troublesome than magic weapons. Because at least with something like a magic weapon, I can just increase the hit points of the monster. When the player's armor class goes up, there's not an awful lot I can do, other than going through and changing the chance to hit for every single monster that I have, which just feels like it's circumvented the whole point of having the magic armor in the first place. But anyway... I'm hoping this covered pretty much everything you needed to know about the magic items in the Lost Mine of Fandalva. If it did, fantastic. As it happens, I have a series of videos on the Lost Mine of Fandalva, which you are welcome to go and check out. Covers, I think, pretty much everything now. I might have left out a few things, but you, you'll find something that's useful. If you're not into the Lost Mine of Fandalva, but you still are interested in hanging around and checking out my channel, I have advice for players and Dungeon Masters. Every aspect of Dungeons & Dragons you can possibly imagine. I have a lot of videos. If you want to support the channel so I keep doing videos like this, you can support me on Patreon. Uh, you can go to the affiliate links, the book depository and Amazon uh, and buy stuff there. Uh, I also have merchandise underneath all of my videos if you're interested. And you can watch my videos. 
Make sure to share, like, and subscribe. Hit the bell button to be notified when I go live and when I publish new videos. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.